I get some people upset here, on how we could file a suit against the regulation. And with all the independent agencies and everybody got one set of rules, and that is, is it economically sound, does it do it steal? But with the EPA, who by the way, couldn't, you know, the administration couldn't get anything out of the Congress on some of the things they're going to do, so they told the EPA to do it. But they have a set of rules under which they can be sued that is equivalent to saying if they're not a terrorist, you can't sue them. And so what we're saying, two things. Let's put the bill in so the guys we sent to Congress and the Senate can vote it up or down. Because then we're not going to get with 500. You know, we'll come back with 50. And let's get a deal so we have a clear understanding what it takes to raise the issue in court. And, and I think if we can get that done, uh, we're going to be uh, doing well. And then we're going to do one other thing. And this is not fair, really, but we're going to do it. And that is we want to get some focus on these regulatory excesses. So we've gotten some real smart people who really understand these issues and some people that run small companies. And we're going to have them all over the country uh, this day, that week, next week, talking about these issues, talking about independent uh, you know, regulations that don't make sense to their business or to their community. Why? We want the Congress to focus on this. When the government was set up in this country, it was a three-part government. The electorate, the executive, the, the legislative, and the judicial. Who the hell ever heard of the regulatory branch? It's 500 times the rest of them. So maybe we ought to have a little oversight. Okay, let me go to the second thing. I'm almost going to get there, Tom. Um, I want to talk about I want to talk for just for a minute. I'm going to make two other comments about the environmental stuff. Um, we need every kind of energy we can get in this country. We need it for a long period of time. And I, you know, I listen to a lot of young people and even some supposedly rational people that think we can do this all tomorrow. Um, um, we can do this all tomorrow uh, with green energy. Uh, right now, today. If you had to do it, and you totally subsidize the green energy we have, we could maybe handle one and three quarter to two percent of our energy needs. Period. You need 20 million barrels of oil every day in this country. Um, and you like the lights, we like the hospitals running, we like our cars to go. Um, we have made in this country extraordinary progress in environmental things, so most people wouldn't say that. We didn't do the Kyoto Accords, others did. They didn't meet their responsibilities. We spent almost $2 trillion. We cut in half the number of BTUs it takes to do anything in this country. We've done extraordinary things um, in, the, uh, in the energy area. And by the way, I, somebody told me there's some protests that's outside and they say I am against uh, fixing the global warming issue. I would tell you that the Chamber of Commerce of the United States, we did a little program on this yesterday. We have identified 151 energy projects nationwide that have been stalled, and we have already supported them, that would create 1.1 trillion boost to the economy and millions and millions of new jobs. You know why these are not in place? Not on my street. Not in my town, not in my state, not on my planet. Um, or not if my union can't have the project, or not if my, um, if my political grouping can't get the credit, or whatever the heck it is. It is just a mistake. Americans know how to do things. And on the other hand, we're so comfortable that, uh, that we find reasons not to do them. So uh, let me go then to the second issue that I just want to make a point about. And I said something about it, so I'll be very brief, and that's infrastructure. I would simply say that we have come to a time, had we not hit this re recession, we would have run into the wall on the infrastructure deal. I'm on the board of Union Pacific Railroad, uh, 35,000 miles of track, uh, cover half of the United States, more, much more, in terms of space. We had just come to the point where we, you know, we were giving business to truckers, which is 
like for railroad is not believing in Santa Claus, you know. And, uh, and the same thing in the ports, same thing in the aviation business, same thing in the roads and bridges. And so we need to have a rededication to building our infrastructure. I want to give you one overriding reason beyond all of that to do it. We're not going back in the housing business in a significant way for those people on the side where I said could be as many as 30% unemployed, contractors. We're not going back there for a while. We've got to eat up that capacity. But we can get tomorrow to building infrastructure in this country and putting those people to work. And we can get 180 to 200 billion dollars of private money that's in this country and not to mention what's around the world to invest in it if the federal government will prime the pump. We have a highway bill in this country that does, that does uh, roads, bridges, and transit. And we haven't had an increase in the federal fuel tax for 17 years. I used to run the Trucking Association and 17 years ago those guys had twice the miles per gallon that they have today. In other words, they were doing, they were getting, you know, three and a half, four miles a gallon. Now you're getting seven and eight miles a gallon in a big truck. And you know what's happened to the cars, and there's far more of them on the road. And so guess what? We're running much more wear and tear on the roads and we're paying half the amount of money for it. Now that doesn't make any sense. And people say, you can't do that, Tom. My own staff says, don't even talk about it. You can't do it. The price of fuel's up. I said, look, you do 15, 20 cents over three years, and nobody's going to notice it, except we're going to have the money to prime the pump. The federal government does 50 percent, the state government does 25, the local government does 25, but the state and local government can't do their deal until they get the federal to step up and do it, and we better do it, or we don't get those jobs, we don't get that infrastructure, and it gets much, much harder to be competitive. Let me sort of end with two thoughts. First of all, and I mentioned this education thing, we need human talent to succeed. What makes us great? It's not our buildings. Sure, we've got great natural resources, we have wonderful land, we have a wonderful system of government, but the bottom line is if you ain't got the people, you ain't got anything going on. And it is a crime what we're doing in our schools, not all our schools, look, we're doing all these, you know, charter schools where you got some school districts that are great, we have private schools, we send our kids. I didn't, I sent my kids to public school, but I live in the right place to do that. And I'm just telling you, we have got to do that. The second thing we have got to do, we have got to recognize who we are. You look around this room and I'll tell you who you are, unless there's an American Indian here, we're all immigrants, and we're descendants of immigrants. And this nation is an aging nation, not as bad as Japan, not as bad as a lot of other countries, but we're an aging nation. And we're a nation that needs certain kinds of skills, and we're a nation that need people to do things that a lot of us don't want to do. So we used to have people sort of, you know, we got about 12 million undocumented workers in this country. We don't have to make them citizens, we have to make them legal. And, you know, so we locked down the borders a little bit. So you know what the farmers did in California? They moved to Mexico to grow their products and then sent them back to the United States. Why? Because they couldn't get the workers. So what we need is a way that farm workers can come in on a seasonal basis. They don't have to sneak over and pay to get here. They can drive in with official papers. And we need a legitimate immigration program, and Democrats and Republicans alike are demagoguing this thing beyond any common sense. And by the way, if we don't have it, we don't go there. And, and from an H-1B visa place, that's scientists and medical people and, 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 and technical gurus and all that. We educate them. We get the best universities. And then we used to say, stay. Now we got two problems. We can't say stay. And they don't want to stay anyway because, you know, they're going to go back to India and work for GE in Bangalore for two years and then they're going to go start their own company. And we have got to keep those people. So simply saying, if we cut down the regulation a little bit, if we build up our infrastructure and we do something about our education system and the reality, the fundamental reality that we need human talent to succeed, we're going to be better off. Finally. Finally, 
what's most needed in this country, and everybody talks about bipartisanship and people are 